Today on Let Me Be Frank, listener questions. Out of the 100 plus questions that we have accumulated from you, our listeners, we picked 21 today to answer. And so we've got some theological, some pastoral, and some fun. So keep your radio right here at 1350 AM, 103.9 FM, or keep us on your phone with the Veritas app. The app, as you know, is available at the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, or VeritasCatholic.com. And if you're enjoying Let Me Be Frank on the app or on podcast, you can help us out by giving us a five-star rating. Let Me Be Frank is brought to you by a grant from Foundations in Faith. Foundations in Faith embraces innovative approaches to funding pastoral care programs in the Diocese of Bridgeport. Resources focus on energizing lifelong faith formation and discipleship and fostering a commitment to justice and accompaniment with our most vulnerable. From seminarians to retired priests, from baptism to last rites, from suburbs to inner cities, the reach is broad, the impact is meaningful. For more information, visit them on the web at foundationsinfaith.org. Okay, here we go. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. I'm Steve Lee, and it is my great pleasure, as always, to introduce Bishop Frank Caggiano. Steve, it's just you and me this week. It feels weird. (laughs) Doesn't it? No guest? (laughs) I like it, though. (laughs) Yeah, it's like the old times. Yes. Yep. Yeah, like the old times. That's right. And today is, uh, this uh, this episode is airing on uh, November 1st. Oh, All Saints. All Saints Day. Please God, one day we'll be in that list. I hope. Uh, amen to that. Yes. Because if we're not, in, when the second coming is, is has happened, there's no middle ground anymore. <laughs> so that's going to be a problem. If you're not in one, it default, you're in the other. So let's pray for the first. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yeah. What's the point of anything if we're not going to make it there? Exactly. So, oh, I yeah. see you have your soccer jacket on. Look at you. The The season is winding down, Excellency. So and how did you do? As of our recording date, we are 10 and 2. So we've been, yeah, we've been stomping through the season. Good for you. Yeah. Was there a championship? And there is not. There is not. But uh, in my heart, my boys are champions no matter what our record is. Oh, I hope they listen (laughs) (laughs) to make up for all the the hard stuff you tell them on the field, screaming, yelling. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. That's right. All the running that I make make them do. Okay. Um, so what are we doing today? We're answering questions. We're going to have some fun. Uh, I, I don't know why I'm always surprised, but I'm always surprised. We get such a good uh, response from listeners yeah. to these shows where we just do mm-hmm. listener questions. Mm-hmm. So we're going to do another one today. Mm-hmm. Um, By we'll, the way, for our listeners, if I may, for, forgive me interrupting, but there are 111 questions that were submitted. <laughs> right. So we're not doing 111 questions, but it's, it's to your point. And that's great. It's great. Yeah. It is great. Uh, so we'll we'll do the first segment. Will be a l- little more serious, theological, uh-huh. Uh-huh. and then uh, the second s- second segment will be more fun questions. So a little lighter. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, yeah, I just have misplaced my glasses. They're are you? Oh, are you wearing- oh, they're on my eyes. Oh, thank God, people can't see me. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want to say anything, Excellency. Is that, oh, senility. Is that what it's like? <laughs> then you forget your name. Uh, God, it's, help us. Oh. it's very, very charming. It, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's one of those days, Steve. It's like, <laughs> everything is breaking. Uh, <laughs> anyway, let's, let's get to the serious stuff. Stop this now. All right. Okay. okay. Let, let's jump in. All right. Here's the first question, Excellency. Uh huh. All right. After feeding the multitudes, there were 12 baskets left over. This is, of course, Mm -hmm. uh, in reference to Jesus feeding the the Mm 5,000. There were 12 baskets left over. What do you suppose happened to all that food? Well, it's a great question. First of all, a lot of the questions are contextual questions of Scripture. And they're fascinating. Unfortunately, we don't have any definitive answers, right? But we could speculate. And I think stand on fairly solid ground. So we're talking about an agrarian and somewhat nomadic people. The shepherds certainly were nomadic. So that being the case, all of the fragments that were collected 
on a theological level, because there are 12, they re represent the 12 tribes of Israel, right? But from a practical human point of view, more than likely, those were used, those fragments were used to continue to feed the 5,000. My mother used to do that all the time. Even mm -hmm. bread that was hard. She would, I called it recycling. She would wet it and then she would make it into a bread pudding or whatever it is. So my guess, my guess is that these people would have probably taken some of it home and fed their families the next day. All right. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see. Question number two. Um, Bishop, is there any knowledge of what happened to Joseph of Arimathea following the crucifixion and resurrection? Now, that's a great question because I didn't have the answer to that question. So I had to do a bit of, of uh, homework myself. What I did know, what we all know from scripture is that Joseph of Arimathea, he was a rich man. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. And he also did not consent to Jesus's crucifixion. Very significant, right? Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus kind of like go hand in hand. Right? But Joseph of Arimathea does appear in the fathers of the church a great deal, all right? Precisely because he was the one who asked for the body of Jesus. Right. So yes. so he was given a privileged place in the in the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. And I think it was because he was a good man, because he was a believer in 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 seed, right? In in essence. But beyond what he did and what and the significance of him being chosen to do this task. Who he actually was beyond what sacred scripture says is not really known in sacred scripture. Now, he does appear later on, which is very interesting. He appeals, he appears in medieval English mythology, folklore, right? With wow. King Arthur. Huh. There's a strain of uh, tale that says Joseph of Arimathea was the keeper of the Holy Grail, right? So, of course, but but that's folklore in that sense. So, the short answer to the question is, um, we really do not know a tremendous amount uh, definitively. But the fact that what we know about him is the most important thing to know is that he was given this task. And the fathers of the church, you know, really highlight that. That is what's important. And we know what's important about him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. But it's fun speculating, though, in some way. Yeah. Well, so speculation, that leads right into our third question here. The, this question says, how do we know what Jesus looked like if there are no descriptions or drawings or paintings? Well, now this question, interesting, because if you accept the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin, yeah. then in fact, we do have a very clear description, a depiction of yes. what Jesus looks like, right? Yeah. But there's other sources too. They may say, well, what? Well, I, I may have mentioned a few podcasts ago, I'm reading this book um, called The Life of Mary, which is the compilation of the private revelations, the mystical revelations to um, three women from Our Lady herself, one of them being St. Bridget of Sweden. Now, what's interesting is all of those uh, private revelations essentially agree when Jesus is described physically. They basically agree in the description, even though they're separated by country, language, and time, mm. right? And how they describe Jesus is, again, if you just try to imagine it in your mind, is not very far afield of what is depicted in the Shroud of Turin, which, if you go online, now with modern technology, it, 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 it the Shroud is almost like a negative, right? It's almost the river. They can yes. actually depict what the Lord looks like. Yeah. So is any of that like absolutely 100% definitive in the sense of like seeing a photograph? No, of course, but they didn't exist. But on the other hand, 
I believe in the authenticity of the shroud, and I do believe there's a place for these private revelations. So I think there's fairly confidence to say this is actually what the Lord looked like. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And the funny thing is, if I may go further, just one step further, it, he wasn't like he, he, he had a stately presence, but he would not have been considered, you know, super handsome by modern Madison Avenue, <laughs> so close, right? Right. Right. Because beauty in God's eyes is not beauty that we've depicted it to be yeah right yeah and that's another lesson to be learned because the lord is beautiful he is beauty i mean you can't get more to the root yeah. so we're fascinated with these conceptions that are just like almost phantasms in our mind about what the most handsome man or, or most beautiful woman should look like it, it, it's a good spiritual lesson too around this question. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, and there was nobody more attractive than him as a full person, right? Without a doubt, yeah, without a doubt. And even that is interesting. Okay, so let's dig a little deeper because yes, you're absolutely correct. There would have been no person who ever lived, he being a divine person with the human nature, who would have been more attractive to the human heart, the human spirit, and yet. The vast majority of people who knew him rejected him. Hmm. Why is that? Because what what do we say? Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. So if you don't have a disposition to see beauty for what it really is, it literally will pass you by, which is what happened in the Via Dolorosa. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to move to the next question, Excellency. Uh, simply, it says, uh, do we know if the Virgin Mary had brothers and sisters? Uh, the tradition holds they did not, Joe Kaminian. In fact, in the private revelations in this compilation in the book, in all three, again, which speaks about Anne and Joe Kim and Mary and, uh, and, uh, and her youth and all the rest, there is no mention of any sisters and brothers for our lady mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay uh so he, this one the next question question number five is a little bit longer okay uh, it says i'm listening to the bible in a year mm -hmm. and learning that god gave many food restrictions to the jews in exodus mm -hmm. do these food restrictions still apply to us or have they been erased with jesus's coming if they've been erased then why they are given along with many restrictions on sexual relations, which properly remain with us today. Why would the food restrictions be lifted while others are not? Now, that's a fascinating question, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the food restrictions are the kosher laws, laws right? That our Jewish brothers and sisters who are observant still live by. And there's a lot of speculation as to why they arose in early Judaism. One school of thought, and it may be the more prevalent one, is that God, in his love for his people, uh, refrained from them eating that which, in the time, would have been the greatest possibility of getting them sick, hmm. such as shellfish, such as pork. Mm -hmm. I remember growing up, my mother always used to, my mother almost never cooked pork, but she was always afraid of, what well, was it, trigonosis? That if you don't cook pork correctly? Yeah, something yeah. bad in there. <laughs> right. Um, because God's not arbitrary, right? God, yes. God doesn't just make rules simply because he wants to do, you know, show that he's the boss. So, so there is a, a spiritual and theological overlay to something which may have been more of a sanitary human uh, 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 concern. All right now, having said that, in the Gospels, Jesus makes it clear that that which makes you unclean does not come from outside of you, but comes from within you. He says in Mark 7, 18 to 19, the Lord says, There is nothing outside the man which can defile him. 
if it goes into him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. Yeah. So the idea that these foods, if you eat them, make you unclean. Yes, that was abolished by the Lord. Yep. For the very reason is that they do not defile you. Now, the question also speaks of the sexual uh, norms. Will they arise from the grammar of who we are as a human being? And they arise from the natural law and revelation. So that has not changed because the human being has not changed, right? right? Yeah, right. So they would they would endure. And that's where there's a great continuity between the moral code in Judaism and Christianity, particularly observant Judaism, right? More conservative Judaism, because the basic understanding of the human person has deepened, but it's kind of consonant throughout the whole thing. Yes. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Um, okay. So sticking with food, uh, next question says, a three-part question, Bishop. Mm -hmm. uh, I still go by the tradition of not eating meat on Friday. Actually, I have stopped altogether in the past few years since COVID. Why was this begun? Why was it lifted? And do you still observe this practice all right so again the interesting thing is it says um it's a tradition right it's a tradition actually in canon law canon 1251 still to this day for all catholics binds them not to eat meat on friday mm. that has never changed what has changed is the concession that in absence of of the in place of the abstinence of meat one could actively do penance in its place that could be of a choice that would better aid your conversion whatever that may be but we have slipped into doing nothing Mm -hmm. And that violates the law, and it violates what, what the intent was all along. And the intent was all along. Where did it come from? It was the sacrifice, right? It literally was the sacrifice of flesh on the cross. So the abstinence of that sacrifice is really an act of penance on our part. It's the recognition that we don't have the sacrifice of animals, right, that day. Because we are adoring the sacrifice of the only son of God who freely gave his life for us, and we don't deserve it. So we're in penance. That's its purpose. Yeah. You know, I remember when I was a kid, people would say, well, tuna fish is less expensive than steak. So what, So is that the reason? Is it monetary? And no, because the opposite is true. Steak is expensive. Lobster is even more expensive. So, I mean, if you're going to eat a lobster on, <laughs> on a Friday, what was the purpose of the penance? <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So it's all about the penance, right? Yes. But but everyone should be clear. If you're not actively choosing a penance on Friday, then you are still bound. We are all still bound to abstain. Now, do I abstain from meat? <clears throat> I would say the vast majority of Fridays I do. If I'm in an occasion where I am at a reception or something where there is no fish right. or it is shellfish, which I do not eat, I do not eat shellfish, mm -hmm. then I have really no alternative. Yeah. But but there's plenty of penance that goes on every day. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh, let's see. Here's the next one. It says, um, across the diocese, mm -hmm. in how many languages is mass celebrated each week? What languages are they? And please feel free to comment on this diversity of languages uh, versus your The One initiative. Ah, excellent. By the way, it says, thank you in advance. Loving the podcast with Steve. Shout out to Steve Lee. <laughs> All right. So you got to finish the question. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the languages. This is what I was able to to just quickly. So, of course, English, Spanish, Haitian Creole, Brazilian Portuguese, Polish, Vietnamese, Italian, Igbo, French, and Korean. Off the top of my head, mm -hmm. are the masses that we celebrate on a given Sunday. Now, the one does not refer to a language. 
the one is the one invitation. And that invitation is given in every language that exists, in every culture that exists, in all the races that exist. So it, 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 the one doesn't imply uniformity. In fact, it implies a tremendous diversity because the spiritual life is going to be lived in very different ways. But the journey is the same for everybody to grow in holiness, to grow in discipleship with the Lord, to encounter him every day, to be able to accompany each other in faith. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when I lived in Brooklyn, that list would have been much longer, right? 26, 28 on a Sunday. Wow. And like when they would have the smaller groups come to, it could be 46 on oh a my Sunday. Goodness. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. That, that Korean one, my parents started almost 40 years ago. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Huh? And still it's still going, going on. strong. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. About Mass, the next question says, why do we celebrate Mass on Sundays and not Saturdays like the Jewish community? Okay. So uh, just, uh, again, it's one clarification. We do celebrate Mass Saturday evenings for Sunday because dusk has already, the day has ended. So it's first Vespers, second Vespers, and of course the morning, right? But prescinding from that, it is really the question of the difference between the Sabbath and the day of resurrection. So in the Decalogue, we are to keep holy. The Sabbath is the seventh day of creation. That is Saturday. We, in faith, celebrate the eighth day of recreation, which is the first day of the week and is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. So people ask, do Christians celebrate the Sabbath? Technically, the answer to that question is no, we do not. Right. Yeah. We celebrate the Lord's day of resurrection or the day of recreation. But the fact that Sunday is to be a day of rest, a day dedicated to God, a day to spend time with family, Mm -hmm. to pray. That's exactly what the Sabbath was. So it's interchangeable in that sense, but technically speaking, the Sabbath is the seventh day we celebrate on the eighth or first day of the week. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Uh, Concerning the transfiguration, why do you think, or what is the church's teaching that only... Peter, James, and John were present. Why not all 12? Mm -hmm. And why were only Elijah and Moses there? How did the apostles know who they were? And why did this occur at all? Okay, so I think going backwards, Elijah, right, and Moses are centerpieces of the covenant, right, with God's chosen people. So there is no Jew who is even remotely familiar with the sacred scriptures that would not know who Elijah and Moses. Now, if you would say physically, what do they look like? Would you actually recognize them? But this is a moment of grace. This is a moment yes. of enlightenment. So it's not the physicality it says, oh, by the way, you look like Moses. You must be <laughs> right? It's the spiritual intuition that comes from the event, right? The yes. theophany. Now, having said all that, text in context, what's the transfiguration? Transfiguration is a moment of encouragement on the road to Calvary. The Petrine Confession, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ. Then Jesus says, I'm going to suffer. Peter says, absolutely not. And Jesus says, you're a devil. Get out of my way. So he's pivoted to Jerusalem. But that road is already tough. And so he gave three of the 12 this encouragement. Now, last piece of the question. Why these three? Why these three? I'm speculating here, but I think I'm on solid foundation because all three had a unique task to play in the very primitive church. Peter, rock, head of the church, would betray Jesus three times, recant in a sense, three times, become the animator and the head of the College of Apostles. James was the head of the church in Jerusalem, who was the first to die of the apostles. James, 
Mm -hmm. And it's the cradle of the faith. That is why all of the violence we have seen in the Holy Land for generations and what's going on now is just the continuation of generations and generations of violence. It's just so heartbreaking because it's also the birthplace of at least the Christian faith. And then there's John. What role did John have? John was the great keeper, steward of the mother of God. And the mother of God was the link, right, in many ways to our son. You know, reading this book on the private uh, revelations is fascinating because it's not public revelation. So there's no obligation to believe it. But when you read it, the intimate bond, the intuition that existed between Jesus and Mary, which is totally believable and totally natural, gave Mary an understanding of viewpoint that the apostles did not have. They could not have had. Mm -hmm. So whoever was going to take care of this chosen vessel had an enormously important role. He could not fail. So that's my thought. These three were chosen because of the leadership they would have on the other side of the resurrection and ascension. Great. Okay. Question number 10, short and sweet. Why is it called the Holy See? Yeah, I always wondered that when I was <laughs> Isn't it like like to see you think a big eye <laughs> is looking? <laughs> but uh, and then of course then the Lord of the Rings came. We don't want a big eye. Oh, big yeah, eye no, is no, no good, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> but in fact, the sea literally is refers to the seat, the cathedra of the bishop. So the holy see is the seat of the holy father. And just for clarity's sake, the Holy See and the Vatican are not the same thing. Because the Holy See is the universal government of the church, which is rooted in Peter. The Vatican is the sovereign state that allows the government to operate globally without other secular interference. So if people say, well, why do you need a Vatican? You need a Vatican so that the governing of the church is not subject to the governance of secular governments. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, we're getting there. We have two more for this segment. Um, here's question number 11. The reading today was the parable of the master who hired servants at various hours of the day. And yet mm -hmm. at the end of the day, all received the same wage, whether working 12 hours or one hour. Mm-hmm. The reader writes, the point of the gospel was the generosity of the master, not to be envious of those receiving the same pay for less work, and we don't think as God does. Could an alternative lesson be to wait back, enjoy the beautiful day, sit and relax, have a good lunch, wait until 4 p.m., and then show up for work for the last hour since you'll be getting a full day, day's pay? What an interesting philosophy there is, right? Dangerous. <laughs> but uh, I think, if I may, Point the question a different way. I do not believe that the main point of the gospel was the generosity of the master. I believe the point of the parable, because it's a parable of the kingdom, is to help us to realize that the wages, the wages we are given, is entrance into the kingdom. And therefore, those who start earlier are not denied anything. They have the opportunity to begin to reap the fruits of the inbreaking of the kingdom in their earthly life. Mm. Those who wait to the end will enter the kingdom. However, they have denied themselves what the earlier workers were able to give. So yes, it's a generosity of the master because he's the one who gives us the wages of the kingdom, which is entrance into the eternal life Christ has won for us. Without that generosity, we would have nothing. But in fact, those who waited are not better off than the ones who started earlier because they had the opportunity to reap the, the, the fruit and the gift earlier Yeah, as seeds in this life. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Final one. Mm -hmm. Why is incense used during ceremonies? Mm -hmm. The reason I ask is that it irritates my throat and it makes me cough. 
Yeah, well, that's a lot of people. I, I try to be judicious in its use. But remember the historical purpose. The historical purpose of incense was to cover over the smell of the animals who would congregate in the back of the churches because the herders and the shepherds many times couldn't leave their flocks out when they went to mass because there would be no flocks left when they came out of mass. Mm. Very practical. Sounds mm. crazy, but very practical. And of course, in a time when sanitation was not like ours, you know, some people could be odiferous too, you know, so the incense covered a multitude <laughs> of issues. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, but in the modern world, please God, in a different world, it only emphasizes what was still true in the Middle Ages, that it had a practical purpose, but it had a, 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 a spiritual, sublime purpose. Yeah. You know, the psalmist, our prayers rise like incense before you, our evening, our evening prayers lift up as, a, as an oblation. So the very sense of looking at the incense rising forward is really symbolically representing our prayers rising up to God. And the sweetness of that smell, this is an act of beauty, is to open up the sense of how we are going to be transformed, not just in mind, but we'll, we, we will smell the sweetness of God for all eternity. Mm. It's just beautiful. Yeah. Right? But it arose from a practical issue. Fascinating, no? Yeah, that's interesting. I love the smell of the incense. So it um, depends which one, because you get cheap incense, no good. Aha. Uh -huh. oh, and then you get that. oh, this oh, the, oh my gosh, this it's like perfume. How many perfumes are there? Yeah. And it yeah. that's how many incenses there are. There's a whole variety. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And by so, the way, before we end, no, no, no before yes, we end, yes. I know we're running late, but practical tip. For anybody who's a sacristan, anybody who knows a sacristan, anybody who likes incense, if you want maximum smoke and maximum smell, grind it. Mm. Okay. Increase surface, and you could get like plumes and plumes and plumes of smoke. Cool. <laughs> not not good for the reader who wrote no, it. No, not for the reader. No, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we'll be back with more listener questions after the break. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Be right back. If you're concerned about your end-of-life plans, searching for a Catholic cemetery, or have loved ones who are buried in one of the 14 Catholic cemeteries throughout Fairfield County, now might be a good time to begin planning for yourself or for other family members. Call one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 to leave a message or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Many people don't realize that they can be buried with their deceased loved ones, even if all of the family's in-ground plots have been taken. The Diocese of Bridgeport Catholic Cemeteries provides in-ground burials, as well as columbarium and mausoleum options. This makes it possible to unite your family together in the same cemetery, and it's an opportunity to build a bridge for your family back to the church. Talking about this issue is not easy, but pre-need planning makes your wishes clear, reduces cost, and helps your family avoid difficult decisions at a time of grief and loss. You can start your planning now by contacting one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. We can guide you through the options, regulations, and considerations to help you make the best decisions for your family. The number is 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. All right, everybody, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. All right, Excellency, these, uh, these, this next set of questions is a little more fun. Yep. Um, Okay, number one. This is two parts, so I'll, I'll ask the first part first. You can answer, then I'll ask the second part. Uh, you're walking down the road, and there's a fork in the road with one sign saying, Road 1 to St. Peter, Road 2 to St. John, Road 3 to St. Paul, and Road 4 to Moses. Which one do you take? Door number three. St. Paul. No question. Okay. I love St. Peter. I love, I love all those. But because Paul is like a hero to me on so many levels. First of all, his conversion story, 
mm-hmm. is so inspiring because even being knocked off, even getting his eyesight back, he could have said, these people are going to kill me. Hmm. And he he went for it. So he's fierce. He's courageous. He's loyal. Once he comes to faith, he worked hard, deep passion, took no nonsense from anybody, nobody preached the charisma. You don't like it. Then just step aside. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. So, I mean, I, I wish I had a lot of those qualities, but I, I just think his conversion from persecutor to evangelist, right? To to his apostleship. Yeah. It's just extraordinary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, part two. Steve is on another road. Saying, oh, I'm going to hear this one now. <laughs> <laughs> road one to Mother Teresa. Mm-hmm. Road two to Pope John Paul II. Oh, mm-hmm. I love Pope John Paul II. Uh, road three to Carlo Acutis. Mm-hmm. And the last says road four, Bishop Caggiano. Uh, please. <laughs> Which one do you take? I <laughs> I am firmly planted on the Camino de Bishop Caggiano. <laughs> oh, Steve, you come on. <laughs> I, I have no reason that to, cost me. <laughs> I have no reason to kiss up to you, Excellency. But uh, uh, I am. I yeah. <laughs> there well, you go. I'm, uh, well, I'm honored. <laughs> I'm, but but imagine walking the road with JP two. Oh my word! Really. Yeah. Just yeah. his life story, just to hear his life story from his own lips. Yeah, I mean, I still think of not to not to believe, but when he stared down the tank as a priest. I mean, they would have run him over. They wouldn't even thought twice about it. I, I said to myself, I don't know if I could do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Well, anyway, thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> You'd have to be in good shape to keep up with JP too. Anyway, he was a he was oh, a no, great the, athlete. The, you're telling me <laughs> another thing we did not have in common. Keep going. <laughs> All right. Uh, here's the next question: uh, What is your favorite religious or Bible movie? Well, I'll answer. I'm I'm curious to hear yours. For me, it was it is Jesus of Nazareth. Mm. Because uh, first of all, I kind of grew up with it. Second of all, I think the music is brilliant in that film to depict what the mysteries that were there. And again, this may be a silly thing to say, but I forget the actor's name in Jesus of Nazareth. But when they focused in on his eyes, they were like piercing, weren't they? Yeah, those bright blue eyes. Yeah, yeah. but it was like he was like they were like burning into you. <laughs> yeah. And this is a movie. Yeah. Imagine, imagine if you met the Lord in, uh, in earthly life, what, what oh, yeah, reaction you would have. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I think my favorite Bible movie is a show. It's The Chosen. I just love The Chosen. Oh, really? But, oh, good. But my favorite religious are, are two, I think. Man for All Seasons, which is just awesome. But oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. The, there's also a movie, Excellency. Do you ever see this movie called Bella? Came out no. 20 years ago or so. No. It's just a, a independent movie. It's about a waitress who finds out she's pregnant. Mm-hmm. And the chef in the restaurant spends the day with her. They both skip work. And as he spends the day with her, as she contemplates what she's going to do with the baby, if she's going to keep it or not or whatever. But mm-hmm. it is just beautiful and moving. Great movie. Wow. Oh, Man for All Seasons, too. I have not watched that in a while. The music in that, too. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah. It's so good. (laughs) Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next next, uh, question. Since you you enjoy astronomy, Mm -hmm. do you like sci-fi movies or TV series? Amen. Yes, yes, and yes. When I have time to watch them, which is always never. But yes. Actually, we we talked about this before. Yeah, Star Trek, and, Star Wars, the whole yes. thing. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then the second part of the question is, do you believe there's life on other planets, whether they're single-celled organisms or more advanced? Whoa, that's, that's interesting. I have thought about this, actually. And while no one knows for sure, there are two opposing observations. 
on the first, the first is by the sheer magnitude of the universe. To think that life would only be restricted to one small planet in a universe that could have trillions and trillions and trillions of planets, even mathematically, is it would be the the possibility of that is almost astronomical. But on the other hand, I call it, I forget exactly what it's called, the great silence. And the great silence is that as we continue to go further and further into the solar system, as we continue to go further and further in explanation that's unmanned, and the further we do with like the James Webb telescope and all the rest, we have seen and heard nothing. Hmm. It's complete silence. Hmm. And it's becoming, therefore, the odds of that being the case as we go further and further and not hearing anything also itself lends one to the possibility that there could actually be nothing, which is remarkable. If that were the case, in and of itself, is remarkable. Now, all of this is speculation scientifically. What difference does it have for faith? And the simple answer to that is it has no effect on revelation. And it has no effect on faith because the Lord is the master and savior of all, period. Now, how he reveals himself, if there were intelligent life somewhere else, this is in the mystery of God to understand. I have no idea. But that our belief is that there is only one savior, right? In like Colossians, of all things, mm-hmm. that's it. So if we find life, we'll introduce ourselves, but I'm still a Christian. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Uh, question number four. It says, they are all beautiful and unique in their own way, but in which church do you feel the most comfortable in our diocese? St. Augustine's. The Cathedral Church. Yeah. Yeah. And that's because I have my own chair. <laughs> 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 but I, I find it. And of course, I have more time there. So this is a bit of an unfair comparison. But at the cathedral, I find it very easy to pray. Mm. And the beauty of the cathedral, particularly its stained glass, I just find it just, I kind of get lost in my reflection. So the cathedral is definitely the church. Nice. We have lots of beautiful churches too. I mean, tremendous. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Nice. Okay. Uh, let's see. Question number five. At some point on the on, at some point on the road to Jerusalem, Jesus sent the apostles out in groups of two to preach, and mm-hmm. if not accepted, to shake the dust off their feet. If Apostle Frank were out there, which apostle would you like to be paired with, and why? Okay, I'll answer it, but you have to answer it too. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, this may be a strange way to answer the question. But once again, I go to periphery, and I would pair off with Matthew. Okay. Again, conversion story. Mm -hmm. Thief, traitor, whole thing. But a man who saw the connection between the Lord Jesus and the Old Testament. Jesus is the new Moses. And of course, I've spoken about the new Moses over and over again. Right. And in many ways, he would have been learned. He would have been worldly. He is converted. He's a believer. And he's articulate in his faith. And I would love to spend time with him and pick his brain. Hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, Steve, who would you pick? Uh, it's so hard. I, <laughs> Well, mine isn't as well thought out as yours, but I think I would pick Nathaniel. Because he has no guile, and so I'll always know where I stand with him. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> you know, it's funny. For, for men so important, we don't know a lot about a lot of them. Yeah. And, and yeah. one would say, well, that's, a, a, that's a, a, a lack. But maybe not. Because in the end, if you're a disciple of Jesus, the only thing that matters is Jesus. Mm-hmm. What do you have to know about someone in the end? Yeah. Other than being faithful to Christ. Right? So there's yeah. a lesson there too. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
Let's see. Uh, we have th- four left. Yes. Uh, this question. I love this question. Yeah. Shoot. Okay. All right. Uh, have you ever seen The Godfather? Other than the violence, do you see it as a great movie? Well, the cable undid my mother because my mother loved The Godfather. And every time it was on at any station on earth, she was watching it. <laughs> okay. So I've seen it. Oh, I can't tell you how many times yeah. I've, seen, <laughs> I've seen this film. At least snippets, parts, all the rest. Now, um, do I think it's a great movie? I think it's in production, cinematography, casting, mm-hmm. and music. It is tremendous film, mm-hmm. without a doubt. The scene we've talked about, about the baptism mm-hmm. of uh, the baby. Uh, and the killing of the people, it's yes. just, is brilliant. Yes. However, having said all that, as an Italian-American, this, and so many other movies, and the worst of them all is The Sopranos, continues to keep alive the stereotype among Italians and Italian-Americans is that we are all either gangsters or gangster lovers. Hmm. And I am neither. Right. So I think from a technical point of view and many others, and my see, and my mother loved The Godfather simply because of the culture, not mm. the violence, obviously not. My mother disapproved of all of that. But this Sicilian and the speaking of Sicilian and the customs and stuff. Yeah. It was a bridge to a, a life for my mother when she was young. That had nothing to do with criminality, but everything to do with the weddings and the dancing and the food and the the family, right? And the vine and the homemade wine and all yeah. this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Huh? G- gosh, I never thought about that because The Godfather is my favorite movie of all time. Is it? Yeah, and so I, ne- but I never thought about the the stereotypes that it was perpetuating. Yeah. So, huh? Interesting. Okay. Okay. So uh, here's the next question. It says. Uh, Bishop Frank, did you have a nickname growing up? Uh, uh, yes. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to know everything. <laughs> yeah, a nickname. Well, yeah, of course. Uh, um, to to the English speaking neighbors I had, they called me Frankie. Mm-hmm. It's like the movie. Isn't there a movie? Because Frankie and Johnny is something, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Frankie. For Italians, I was called Cheech. Because what that's is- one of the nicknames. Yeah. Don't ask me the etymology or the history. I have no idea. I, I don't use it myself personally. <laughs> but, but that's what they would call it. Yeah. Oh. Cheech. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah. Don't you dare use it now. Keep going. No, no. I never. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, so, uh, related to names, do your sister or nieces and nephew call you Excellency or Bishop? Well, I've tried to have them call me my Lord, but it doesn't work. <laughs> 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 so, so my my sister calls me Frank, of course, mm-hmm. and my niece and my nephew call me Uncle, and my niece's children also call me Uncle. So I'm Uncle. And my nephew is Uncle Dom to mm-hmm. them, mm-hmm. but that's basically how it's how it's how is and it's always been that way. Okay, in public everywhere we are. Yeah, I love it. I, I remember you saying that before. Yeah, I I, I got uh, one of my nephews, one of uh, actually Rula's nephews, when he was really little. I had uh-huh. him for a while, calling me King Steve. And oh, then, but that only lasted like a short time, and then his parents put a stop to that pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Final question. Did you play sports or act in high school or college? Okay. Act. No, I did uh, debate. I didn't do sports. Uh, we had talked about this before because I had rheumatic fever when I was 10. Yes. Yes. So I was, n- I was really not, supposed to do any physical activity like that until I was 17 or 18, I think. Now, of course I did. I ran the, the, uh, the reservoir 
as part of that annual torture that we had at Regis. You'd have to run the mm -hmm. the, the Central Park Reservoir. And I told you about cheating, going through the side path. <laughs> and I'm sorry, bless me, Father Fryson. <laughs> uh, but no, I did not. Actually, I didn't take, take up real sports in that sense and real significant physical exercise until I was 34. Wow. Wow. But you also said that when you were little in the streets with your friends, you would yes, do stuff. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. You used to play stick you were and all that stuff. Yeah. It's, yeah, we were. Okay. But then I, that came to an end when I had rheumatic fever. But now I think looking back, that's what, how that's how the doctor understood it. I don't think there was any need for a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Well, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But and And there's no acting or anything in your background. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> acting out, yes, but not acting. <laughs> acting up, yeah. <laughs> acting up, yes, but not acting. <laughs> oh gosh, that's funny. Um, I actually did both excellencies. So I, as you know, I played soccer all my life, and mm -hmm. I and and I've done martial arts all my life, mm -hmm. and a lot of basketball. Which do you prefer, uh, martial arts or soccer? So I've I've never done anything as well as I've done martial arts in my life. Ah, but uh, but I love soccer. <laughs> yeah. So good for um, you. And then I also did. It wasn't acting, but I did uh, per, on stage performances. I used to sing with an a cappella group in college. So really, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. wow. I, I I could. Yeah. Well, I don't sing that well, to be honest. I was never trained, and I don't have the. Like even at mass, I do, but I have to practice. And sometimes we go off into the stratosphere. So I ask our lady, bring me back <laughs> to the realm of mere mortals so we can finish this prayer. <laughs> uh, but I guess I could learn it, I suppose. But yeah, and, and acting, I would be too uh, on a stage. See, it's one thing. It's, it's, it's fascinating. I'm very public. Yes. That's and why I asked, actually. Yeah. Or, I mean, that's why I followed up on yeah. the listeners. In question. social settings, you know, even though I'm I'm basically an introvert, I, I love people and I could hang out with people and I think they have a good time. I I certainly have a good time. When I celebrate the sacraments in public events like that, it's I'm praying, so I don't care who's there. But the, none of that really kind of like faces me. Yeah. And when I give public talks, I told you I went from stuttering to now being able to do it, and that's just by sheer practice yeah right that's all mm -hmm. okay cool so that was fun so uh we'll take the, if uh people have been paying attention on these listener question shows we come back for the third segment and i ask a question that's on my mind so we'll do that when we come back from the break this is let me be frank on the veritas catholic network Hey, this is Matt Sparazza from The Tangent. Each week on The Tangent, my co-host, Father Sam Kachuba, and I go on tangents to show how intertwined the Catholic faith and our culture really are. With guests like Scott Hahn, Dr. Greg Pitaro, Kristalina Everett, and so many more, The Tangent is always entertaining and informative. Check us out on Fridays at 12.30 on 103.9 FM, 1350 AM, anytime on the Veritas app, or wherever you get your podcasts. God bless. Okay, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano. All right, Excellency, so here is my question. Um, so much stuff happening in the world, Israel and Hamas, the recent uh, tragedy in Maine with the shootings, and then, you know, everybody has a lot of stuff in their own personal lives as well going on, and just how do we keep our chins up? How do we keep from falling into despair? How do we keep that hope? Right. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, it's an excellent question and we could spend an entire podcast trying to answer it together, but this much I would say, first and foremost, if you're looking for hope and you're looking to avoid despair, you and I, and everyone listening is not the origin of that hope. Right. Hope is keeping our eyes fixed on eternal life. So if we believe we're going to solve all of these challenges without God's help, it won't happen. And that's the road to despair. 
because it will not work. It'll fall apart. So in a sense, you don't fall into despair in part by recognizing that God is there for the asking and we need to ask. We need to pray and we need to be confident that God will do what is best for us, even when we botch it up, which we do. But the other piece to this puzzle, too, is there are signs of hope around us, but we have to we have to take consolation from them. Like the world is in bad shape, but not the entire world's in bad shape. Mm-hmm. And that is part of this renewal that I'm hoping for the diocese is that people will see our parishes as places of joy and hope in a world that's otherwise troubled. And that's that will strengthen the individual person's hope Yeah, that I'm not delusional. There is a better way. Yes. Mm -hmm. So. Great. Thank you. So uh, keep your questions coming in. Uh, Most people are, yeah, most people are emailing them at questions at veritascatholic.com. You can also send them in on social media. We have a feature on our website at veritascatholic.com where you can um, speak your questions in if you want. You hit the record button and we'll Uh we'll get it as a recording. So nobody's had the uh, courage to try that yet, but um, it's there. Bishop Frank Caggiano is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So is Veritas Catholic Network. And a big thank you to our sponsor, Foundations in Faith. A grant from the St. Therese Fund for Evangelization makes it possible for us to bring Let Me Be Frank to you. Foundations in Faith is committed to supporting and transforming pastoral ministries in the Diocese of Bridgeport. And you can learn more about their outstanding work at foundationsinfaith.org. Thanks, Excellency. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. I like yeah. these segments. Yep. Yeah, these are good. These are good. Before you, we go, would you please give us your blessing? I'd be happy to, happy to. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord our God, send your spirit upon us with great abundance, that we may be a people of hope, that we may be a people of joy, and that we may surrender to you so that we might become your instruments of the reconciliation and renewal that the world seeks. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come upon us and remain with us forever. Amen. Amen. All right, Steve, next week, same time, same place. Sounds good, Excellency. See you there. All the best.